Welcome back to ECE 442-542. This is lecture 5.2, part B, and we're talking about the three performance specifications for second order systems. So we're trying to find this relationship between two poles in the complex z-plane and what they correspond to in the time domain performance realm or what do they look like in terms of settling time, percent overshoot, and peak time. Or you could entitle this little piece which is sort of the overview or the summary part of this lecture is translating design specs into breakfast cereal. And what I mean by that is what are the breakfast cereal shapes that are associated with each of these three different time domain performance or design specifications. I may call them design specs, I may call them performance specs. But when you hear settling time in this class in the z-plane, what shape should you be thinking of relative to the z-plane shape for settling time? And in that case, this, you should be thinking circles. Percent overshoot. Percent overshoot, you think damping ratio zeta, which is a logarithmic spiral. But here, just to sort of think about breakfast cereal, we're thinking hearts. These are these, a little bit of a distorted heart, but it's a heart shape on its side and peak time, that's now this theta sub d, this angle in the z-plane, but we're now calling that wedges, but you could think of it as an angle. And those are now the three shapes. That's how we're translating these three design specifications, or these three performance specs, into locations. And by locations, I'm meaning on these shapes, that's where we now locate our dominant poles in this two-pole transfer function that we're approximating the overall behavior of our system, or that's our desired transfer function's dominant pole location. Let's look at this a little bit more closely. Settling time, again, we're thinking circles. And if you just think of a underdamped second order system response. You have this overshoot characteristic and then it finally wiggles down and gets inside this 1% tube. When it finally gets into the tube and stays in the tube, the first time that it gets into that tube and stays in the tube is what we're calling the settling time T sub s. And if our tube is of size 1%, of the final value, then that's our 1% settling time. We just quickly draw this continuous time shape, but in this class you can just sort of envision sampling that, or we now have values, sequence values, at these various time locations. And we want to know when do we finally get inside that 1% tube. Well, that then translates into, if you remember, an initial condition response. It's influenced, or how it settles, the exponential decay is influenced by the distance that particular pole is from the origin in the complex z-plane where here I'm illustrating two different scenarios. The R1 scenario, now you would have two poles, a distance R1 from the origin. In the R sub 2 radius scenario, now we have two poles that are a distance of R sub 2 away from the origin. And the value at time, capital N sub 1, let's assume n sub 1 and n sub 2 are the appropriate 1% sample periods or number of samples to get into the 1% tube. x at time n sub 1 is now 1% of x of 0. 
x at sample point n sub 2 is 1% of x sub 0 corresponding to the poles that are r sub 2 away from the units or, or away from the origin in the complex z plane. If that's the case, we now have these concentric circles, and the circles have different radii depending on how fast the system is settling. Suppose now we are having R1 is larger than R sub 2. How is N sub 1 related to N sub 2? Is N1 larger than N2, or is n1 less than n2 if r sub 1 is of a larger radius and now I'm assuming that these particular radii are inside the unit circle so these are now associated with a settling time response they are collapsing now r1 being greater than r sub 2 means that n sub 1 is in fact larger than n sub 2. It takes longer to get inside the 1% tube when those poles are further away from the origin or they are closer to the unit circle. That's the settling time spec and that deals with circles. The percent overshoot, think zeta, the damping ratio, but the shape associated with percent overshoot is now going to be what we're calling hearts or it's really these logarithmic spirals and the percent overshoot if somebody now gave you this step response behavior you could numerically calculate the percent overshoot once you know y max the peak value or y peak and the final value the percent overshoot from those two numbers is now simply y peak minus y final value over y final value times 100 percent if somebody now gave you this curve in the time domain for a signal y, y of n, you could now determine the percent overshoot from that measured data. y peak minus y final value. So if y peak, let's say, is 1.5 and y final is 1, then we have a 50% overshoot that can be related for this second order system response to the damping ratio zeta. So if somebody gave you a zeta value you could compute its percent overshoot. And we will also show how you can solve this equation for zeta well, we may not show it, but we'll just give you that relationship. You now have the log of that squared over pi squared plus the log of that squared square rooted. That's now the zeta value, and we'll develop that later, or we'll use that formula later. So somebody could give you the damping ratio, or they could give you the percent overshoot, and you now know that connection. And again, it's this curve where you have percent overshoot and zeta, and the curve is now doing something like that. Or if you now had, let's just hypothetically, let's say this is now 0 0.5, and that now corresponds to a given percent overshoot. In fact, if you now had a zeta of 0 0.07, that corresponds to a 5% overshoot. Where does that zeta end up being inside the Z or on the Z plane? Here's the unit circle. What value of zeta corresponds to the unit circle and what kind of dynamical behavior if you now had two poles and they were on the unit circle, what kind of a response would that correspond to?
And if that's not seeming clear, you could actually sort of say, well, I'm not quite sure what that does, but I do know if I had a pole there, if I had two poles there, what that would look like. If you now had one pole there at z equal to 1, that's now going to give you a constant response. If you had any other two complex conjugate poles on the unit circle, that's going to give you a sinusoidal with no damping. It's going to be a sustained sinusoidal oscillation. There's no damping, so that means the damping ratio zeta is equal to zero. We've talked about this quite a bit in terms of translating the z location in the complex z plane. So now if you had poles here, those poles are now at some distance r away from the origin and at some angle theta sub d. That's now, let's call this z sub 1, that's now what this is. Well, we can rewrite r in terms of zeta, the damping ratio, the natural frequency, omega sub n, and the sample period. Here is r, and here is theta sub d. You can also remember that omega sub d is omega sub n square root of 1 minus zeta squared. That's again just that right triangle relationship between zeta and the natural frequency. So that this now is in fact our theta sub d. If we now wanted to say what happens as if zeta is fixed and we m vary the natural frequency omega sub n, you can hopefully see that as we increase omega sub n, r is decreasing and theta sub d for a fixed zeta value and increasing omega sub n, theta sub d is increasing. So that if we actually wanted to draw a particular zeta, a constant damping ratio curve in the z-plane. This may not be very accurate, but you now might say that that's now, that's obviously bigger than zeta equal to zero. This might be zeta equal to 0 0.7. Our radius is reducing as our angle, theta sub d, is increasing as we go to higher and higher omega sub n values. The extreme would be zeta then as equal to 1 on the real line in the z-plane. Again, what happens on the other extreme? At the other extreme, zeta is equal to 0. Our damping ratio now for an underdamped response is going to vary between zeta equal to 0, the unit circle, no damping, and zeta equal to 1, which is on this real line segment between 0 and 1 in the complex z-plane. If that's the case, then what can you say about this relationship between the damping ratio and the percent overshoot? As zeta increases, now we're moving from the unit circle collapsing, collapsing, our, get, our hearts are getting smaller, the percent overshoot is actually going to decrease as the zeta value increases. As our damping ratio increases, our percent overshoot, and remember our percent overshoot is how large does, is that peak relative to the final value. And here is the expression if we wanted to compute percent overshoot from numerical data. That's the second design specification. The third design specification or performance specification, what shape does that correspond to? This is the shape that we said is a wedge or wedges and you could also think of this as an angle. Well, the time to peak, again, relative to this second-order underdamped
time response behavior and realize that we are in the discrete time setting. So even though it's quick to draw that continuous time curve, think of these as just connecting the dots in our time sequence leading up to and going beyond our peak time. For a second order underdamped system, you can derive the relationship between time to peak, and I may write that as a lowercase t sub p or an uppercase capital T sub p. That's pi over omega sub d, where omega sub d is our damped frequency of oscillation. And remember what that corresponds to in the S plane. Those are now these horizontal lines, and as you get those horizontal lines or omega sub d higher, the horizontal lines are further away from the real line segment in the complex S plane, the faster, the quicker you're going to reach that peak, the smaller t sub p is going to be. We can also now use this relationship to solve for omega sub d. Omega sub d is now pi over time to peak. And how is theta sub d, the angle in the z plane? Here is our radius r. Here is our angle theta sub d. That's for a given z value. And if we now had a pole there and it's conjugate below the real line at the same symmetrical angle minus theta sub d. Now that point is a distance r from the origin and an angle of theta sub d. How do we define theta sub d relative to omega sub d? Well that's now just omega sub d times the sample period t. And we now know that omega sub d is pi over t sub p, so now we could say that theta sub d is pi t over t sub p. This now allows us to rewrite or to solve for t sub p in terms of theta sub d, so if somebody now gave you a theta sub d, you could tell them what the peak time is. The peak time now is going to be pi t over theta sub d. So if they give you a theta sub d, you can now calculate time to peak. Or if theta sub d increases, now let's say theta sub d is here. As theta sub d increases, the time to peak, what's it going to do? Well, here's our equation for time to peak in terms of theta sub d. If theta sub d gets bigger, for a fixed pi, pi is fixed, t is fixed, time to peak is going to decrease. That now is a quick summary of these three design specifications, settling time circles, percent overshoot hearts, peak time wedges, and how they then translate into different versions of the circles, concentric circles, smaller circles, faster response, hearts, logarithmic spirals, the smaller that heart, it's collapsing from a circle into a heart shape, the smaller the heart, the bigger the zeta, the smaller the percent overshoot, and peak time, how long does it take to get to the peak? If we want that peak time to be shorter, then we need to increase theta sub d.